starts with the offensive line as always because you have to protect Trevor Lawrence. Uh, he took a ton of hits this year. We know about the Urban Meyer fiasco. Uh, they have a ton of needs on the offensive line coming up. They're going to lose four players. Cam Robinson's the most important of those players who played left tackle. So it certainly makes sense that you would target an offensive lineman in this draft class. The issue, of course, is that they have the first overall pick and they may end up having to take an edge rusher. So that's the concern there. Uh, they also have needs at wide receiver. They're losing DJ Shark. At least he's going to be a free agent. They weren't very explosive at the wide receiver position. We heard Pete Prisco talk about that time and time again throughout the season. They need to get more explosive at that position. They won't take one at the top of the draft. At least I don't think they will, but they'll have plenty of opportunities uh, later in the process. They have a handful uh, of picks in the top 100, so that's also something they could target. And finally, they need cornerbacks, uh, which is sort of weird since Urban Meyer traded away one of their first-round picks at corner in recent years. That's also uh, troubling, but now they're moving on. They're hopefully finding a coach that, that will get this thing right. They only have one cornerback under contract as we sit here. So that's the lay that's what we're looking at here with the Jaguars. I think he's the best tackle in college football. He is outstanding. He's a, a huge a huge man in good shape. He has got that athleticism that you don't always associate with a big guy. He is strong. He's a big man. He takes up a lot of space. He has a nice first step. Um, he gets from point A to point B very fast. There were times this season where he wasn't exactly lights out, and that happens with young players. That's not necessarily a surprise, and it's part of the reason why I have him as my 1B in terms of my, my top offensive tackle. First, I have Ike Kwanu out of NC State, but right behind them, and it's a hair's difference, is Evan Neal, who played left tackle this season for Alabama. We know they made it to the national title game and, and had that thing close until the end there. It was a hard, hard times there, you know, when you don't have a win for so long and you're battling, you're battling, you're battling. And, um, you know, being able to finish the season the way we did is, is a testament to not giving up in those situations and, and digging further, digging further deep. And like Dan likes to say, taking, taking the hard road, hard road one more time. And that's something we did today and over the last handful of weeks. We've had so many ups and downs this year that I, I don't think we give enough credit to Dan Campbell. You know what I mean? He's a hell of a coach, man. And like I said, he always preparing us each and every week to go out here and compete. To the, against the best of the best, you know what I mean? So at the end of the day, I feel like, I feel like, man, things are coming together. We got a lot of draft picks. A lot of young guys are going to have to step up. We got a lot of experience this year. A lot of young guys played, which I think is going to help us a lot next year and the years moving forward. Um, so I can't wait to see what we do in these upcoming years, and I'm excited. I think when you got that foundation like the offensive line, you could plug in skilled position guys behind them. Look at our running back position. Every time a running back came in, he had success, and that's because of the front line. So I think they have set the foundation with the front line. Now it's just a matter of just putting certain pieces in that can help that offense go to the next level. I believe it's the best rushing season for a Lions team in quite some time. Switching gears to the defense, there are question marks because of so many injuries on the back end. But Tracy Lock Walker looked pretty good. He's no longer on his rookie contract. Oh, that's my guy there. I love Tracy Walker. To me, he's the bell cow on that defense. He's the emotional leader. He's the guy that quarterbacks the secondary lines those guys up. And he's our thud. He comes in there and he hits people. I don't care what size they are. So a guy like him, you definitely need to try to re-sign him. Guys like Jalen Reeves Maven, the guy that's all over the field. Charles Harris, a guy that can provide some pass rush. And think about this, Jamie, we still got Romeo, he's coming back. You got Jerry Jacobs, you got Jeff Okuda. We don't know what guys. we have in Okuda. Exactly, but these are guys that you know that you could put in position and hopefully these guys will be able to step up. But Aiden Hutchinson is a guy who I watched after the 2019 season where the, the bust began, and, and I didn't see it. I didn't see him as a first-round talent. I honestly, I thought he was a, a day three guy. Uh, last year was a COVID season, so it's hard to take anything away from that. And then he came back this year w with a purpose and a focus, and he was bigger, he was stronger, he was faster. He checked all those boxes that you want checked when you're trying to decide who's a first-round pick, especially at that position. And I was blown away. And I'll tell you this, Chris, uh, midway through the season, the conversation was always about Kayvon Thibodeau being the first player taking the edge rush out of Oregon because he's a special talent, no doubt about it. But I texted a couple scouts and said, how crazy is it to say out loud that Aiden Hutchinson might be better than Kayvon Thibodeau? And the response I got wasn't, you are indeed crazy. It was, that that makes some sense. And that will be a conversation teams will have going forward. Uh, so I think that's where the consensus is going to settle.
But let's not forget, this was a, a joke of a franchise uh, a year ago. Uh, and uh, Cal McNair, who took over for his father, um, was not running the operation very well and was listening to Jack Easterby, who a number of folks could question whether uh, or why he had so much power within an organization. And Nick Casario came in to steer the ship in the right direction. And right now we're talking about a 4-13 and Texans team that, frankly, it was a team going into week one that I thought might tie one of their 17 games. And that was about it. Um, it was a, a roster devoid of talent. And that David Culley was able to squeeze four wins out of this team, that he was able to keep them competitive in a few more. I thought that he did a fantastic coaching job. I thought that he exceeded expectations. And when you put on top of it, the circus that the Texans had to deal with, with Deshaun Watson week in, week out for the preseason, and then through the trade deadline, um, it's a shame that this end has happened with David Coley. However, I think that he understood that this was a possibility when he signed the contract. Uh, and like I said, the last couple of days has not been safe there in Houston. Well, you mentioned the injuries, Brandon. So he came out against Fresno State and was just tackling everything behind the line of scrimmage that moved, got injured with the ankle injury, sat out a while, came back, and was still dominant. So uh, at the end of the day, if you're an NFL team and you need an edge rusher and you have a top five pick, Kayvon Thibodeau is going to be one of your likely targets. And it makes sense if you're going in the top five uh, that you don't need to go back to college unless you're Andrew Luck. And Thibodeau doesn't play quarterback. He's an edge rusher, so it makes sense that he would uh, forgo his final year at Oregon uh, to take his uh, game to the NFL where he'll, he'll make a, a nice little bag of money there. In terms of the season, um, four wins isn't where we want to be, obviously. Uh, it was a tough year from that regard. Uh, but today really kick-started our after-action process. Uh, and, and really kick-started the offseason. So it was great getting together with the, with the players on exit interviews, uh, hearing them out. And there's a lot of things, a lot of reasons to be excited. And a lot of that is because of the, the man to my left and, you know, um, hiring coach and uh, his ability to teach, to inspire and lead. Um, we really feel like we have the foundation in place uh, now moving forward. Uh, we're, just, we're just ready to kick-start kick this offseason. How about you? Does it feel like 10 years ago that you were hired or yesterday? <laughs> Feels like 10 years ago. No, it was, uh, it's been an awesome year. I, I, like, like I've said, I'm, we're, we're one of 32 and we're, um, you know, so we're blessed in every way. And uh, like Joe said, four wins is never enough. And, uh, but uh, it can't overshadow uh, all the progress that this organization has made over the last year and, uh, and the opportunity we have over the next calendar year to make even more progress. And so, um, yes, it's been a roller coaster. Uh, there's been hair, uh, some hair pulling moments, even though I don't have any. But um, but it's been it's been an awesome ride, a tremendous learning experience, and something that it, and like like I've said before, a foundation's been laid that uh, that will allow us to build some of these skyscrapers that we're really excited about building here in the future. Yeah, the injury is not going to be a problem, Amanda. And he's extremely, immensely talented and maybe ends up being the best defender off that national championship team from 2019. That secondary included Grant Delpit, who plays for the Browns now, Christian Fulton, who plays for the Titans, two very good uh, defensive backs who went in the second round when they were drafted. And Stingley has a chance to be, to be better than, than both those players. Uh, ideally, he, he comes in and performs like Patrick Sertan has this year, like J.C. Horn did for Carolina before he got hurt. That's the type of difference maker you're looking for uh, when you draft someone with a top 10 pick and Stingley is every bit that top 10 pick. Uh, the good news is if you're a team looking for a cornerback, it's a decidedly deep class at the cornerback position and I'll imagine five, six guys could end up going in the first round as cornerbacks. But as we said here, Stingley is my number one cornerback. I have zero concerns about him only playing those three games you talked about. He will be a, a top draft pick based on his body of work uh, while healthy at LSU. The New York football giants, one of the top tier organizations of football, three coaches, two year lifespan for all three of them. That's why I think it took 48 hours, Mike, to your point, because I think they were probably going, are we really about to do this again? Like, wait, let's sleep on it or something, because like, this is unbelievable. We're coming to this determination again. And of course, you know, they had to do what they had to do there. And it's, it is the right decision at this point. But just amazing. Mike, I'm sorry. Just as a Giant fan, of course, you know me growing up. The Mara family, who I have a lot of respect for, it's, it's, uh, it's, I'm troubled by it. It just it stinks as a Giant fan.
He does everything you want an offensive lineman to do. He gets down and dirty. He's a gritty player. He's tough. He, he finishes all of his plays. And he's a really intelligent guy on the football field. He's a converted defensive lineman, came into Iowa playing D-line as an All-American, and it's paid off on the offensive line because you can just tell he knows exactly what to do when those D-linemen try to pull out some of their veteran moves and tricks. I'm super excited about what he's going to be able to do. Obviously, Iowa's got a tradition of offensive linemen, but here's a guy who's showing through. I'm excited. He earned the spot as number one on the JP30. The offensive line is a total disaster. Uh, the Sam Darnold situation is just a problem. I mean, they owe $19 million next year and they can't get out from under it because of the fully guaranteed fifth year option that they picked up kind of um, unnecessarily, I thought, but you know, that's, we'll, we'll see, we'll deal with that in the off season. Uh, I mean, generally speaking, it would be wild if the Panthers moved on from Matt Rule after two years, after giving that huge deal and luring away from Baylor. And it would be some serious egg on David Tepper's face. So I think we'll probably see another full year of Matt Rule before we start getting a, a fully hot seat check in uh, Carolina. He is a mauler, and he's got really good feet and balance and pass protection. He's got that wrestling background, comes from a very athletic family. This is a kid who wants to be great, studies, works hard, really passionate about the game of football. Ikwanu has to be. His brother's at Notre Dame on the defensive side of the ball. It's a very athletic family he comes from. This kid is, has a professional mentality, and you love that with your offensive line. they got to be consistent, play in and play out. they got to be focused, play in and play out. Can't have any hiccups. I would say it's split, but Iguanu gets some, 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 uh, uh, some uh, I'd say votes, if you want to say, and some credit for being a great player and being right there, maybe slightly ahead of Evan Neal. So we'll have to wait and see how that plays out. It's very early right now in the process, but there, it's kind of neck and neck. It's kind of one and one A right now with Iguanu and Neal. Yeah, I think this is where you get the pass rusher. And, and Dave Ojabo from Michigan, yeah, Aiden Hutchinson on one side, dynamic. So is this kid. First year as a guy full-time out there getting after the quarterback, limited in football background. Didn't play football until a, a junior year in high school. Mm. 11 sacks, five fourth stumbles. What a player he was. He's going to keep getting better and better. Opposite Ojalari, that could give the Giants a lot of ability to get after the quarterback. I think the tough thing about Arthur Smith's first year was he was taking over a team that needed to be in rebuild mode but they couldn't because they couldn't start over at the quarterback position given his contract. They couldn't cut Matt Ryan. They couldn't move on from Matt Ryan. So they kind of have to deal with what they had. And unfortunately, that led to a defense that even under Dan Quinn struggled to be able to rush the opposing quarterback. They could never really find that edge rush after Vic Beasley kind of failed to be that. Tack McKinley failed to be that. Uh, and so they struggled. They're actually worse in the league at getting after opposing quarterbacks. The offensive line, which they've tried to draft and improve over the years, that they couldn't protect Matt Ryan. Calvin Ridley barely played this year. Kyle Pitts was probably the only bright spot, uh, their first round draft pick. That's really the only thing you can hang your hat on. And now the problem is the fact that you're going to have, what, a top 10 pick? and yet you still have a contract that you can't get out from underneath. Is Kyle Hamilton, safety from Notre Dame. This guy has a chance to be really special in the NFL, and we don't typically talk about safeties as top five picks, but if there is a guy that is worthy of that type of consideration, it is Kyle Hamilton who brings a rare blend of size, athleticism, versatility, physicality, coverage, instincts. This guy can do it all. He's the ideal matchup neutralizer. He's a defensive chess piece. And when you think about these NFL offenses today and how they challenge defenses with pace and space, and they try to create these mismatches, a guy like Kyle Hamilton is invaluable because of what he brings to the table. Yeah, this is a, yet another disappointing season for the Denver Broncos, who really have had a rough patch in a in a franchise which usually, you know, when Brady and I were on these teams, kind of consistent winners, we're getting to the playoffs, you know, had a, a ownership which was stable. Now you're seeing turnover. They can't figure out the quarterback position, can't figure out the coach. It's a little bit of a mess. This is now six straight postseasons. Uh, that they have missed the playoffs. Uh, it's it's bad. It's bad. Now, I, I don't know if it's as much of a done deal with Vic Fangio. I mean, maybe JLC is right and it's going to move that way. But I do agree that the quarterback is another one where you've got massive question marks. Teddy Bridgewater now back free. 
Drew Locke, a little bit of a shaky start. I don't like what we're seeing there so far. So this is a franchise for me that I look at. I give them a D minus. I just, uh, it's it's hard to say F because it's not a complete disaster, which we're going to get to one of those in a little bit. I just think this franchise is a complete mess right now. And the, the bad thing is there's not, where was the optimism? There really hasn't been any for this fan base. You got Kenny Pickett, who had 50 career starts, right? He's a veteran. He's a 24-year-old rookie he's going to be. He's a guy coming with Mark Whipple, did a great job, quarterback coach coordinator. Mark's now at Nebraska, but when he was at Pitt, did a great job working with Kenny Pickett. Kenny Pickett is, and I hate this term, and I'm not going to use it, so I, 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 won't, I shouldn't even say it. Talk about NFL ready. The worst term any analyst can use is NFL ready. And they'll say that about Kenny Pickett. I'm just going to say he's Derek Carr, Andy Dalton. He's somewhere in that Andy Dalton, Derek Carr mode. That's what you're looking at with Kenny Pickett, okay? Kenny Pickett is going to be in the top 15 of this draft, okay? I think that's, I wouldn't say it's guaranteed, but he's going to go somewhere in that top 15, top 20, okay? Charles Cross, watching the pass protection every week in Mississippi State. Really impressed. Now, Sam Williams, from Ole Miss, got him for a sack. Outside of that, Charles Cross in pass protection has basically flawless this entire year for Mississippi State. The reality is this season, I don't really know what their ceiling was. I mean, Ryan Fitzpatrick was supposed to be your starter. Even if he plays his best football, maybe you're competing for a wild card spot. You're not being the Dallas Cowboys, not the way they look this season. And even at that point, what's the long-term plan? I mean, given his age and all of that, he's got maybe a year or two left. Now he's a free agent. So now you're trying to figure that out. But you know, outside of a couple of playmakers that they have in Terry McLaurin, for example, or Antonio Gibson, the offense is kind of void of that. You know, Chase Young gets hurt. He's your best defensive player. And the secondary can't stop anyone. I mean, overall, I think they are competitive and they continue to fight. And that's a cultural thing that's like hard to really, uh, you know, put your finger on exactly what it is outside of Ron Rivera getting those guys to still play hard for him. But this team's got a lot of work to do in the offseason if they want to be able to have any shot at truly competing for the division with Dallas or Philly for that matter. Yeah, final see really the last two seasons, he just thrived in Lane Kiffin's offense. And when you watch him on tape or just sitting on your couch on Saturdays, you see the competitiveness, the toughness, the love he has for the game, and the love that he has from all of his teammates. I mean, he just gets everyone to rally around him. When you study him as a player, a quick release, he's just got such a quick trigger. He throws the ball accurately down the field, and he can extend plays. Now, the big question, in my opinion, is, can Corral stay healthy with his body type and style of, a pl of play? He's aggressive, he likes to run. Can he stay healthy and learn to protect himself at the next level? That's gonna be a, a big key to his long-term success. And, and look, they've got great stadium, great practice facility, state-of-the-art. The Wilfs will spend money on players. You just need to have the right players. And I, I you know, I, I was stunned that Rick Spielman was fired after 16 years with the team, but I, it's what happens when you hitch your wagon to Kirk Cousins. Frankly, sorry, but that I think that's what brought him down because I think the final analysis is we blew it on this one. We paid this guy way too much money, and even though he throws for a lot of yards and touchdowns, th there's a ceiling on what he can do, right. and that reinforced the ceiling on what the Vikings can do. So I went with George Karloftis, the defensive end from Purdue. This guy can play outside. He can work outside in moves as a pass rusher. Saw a lot of double teams uh, at Purdue, but still was very productive. And anytime you watch the tape, he's always around the football. I love his motor. I love his toughness and the versatility that he brings. And this is why it's important for the Browns to create the impression for now that they're all in with Baker Mayfield. This is why I believe they they took advantage of the fact that they own 132nd of NFL Network and put out the word on Sunday of week 18 that, that they plan to move forward with Baker Mayfield. If you are perceived as being desperate, anxious to trade him, to get somebody else, the price goes down for no what doubt. you get for Baker Mayfield. Yeah. The price goes up 
for whoever you replace him with. They need to to have the attitude. And Shereen and I were talking about this yesterday. I mean, every time I buy a car, I work myself into a legitimate state of mind where I don't want the car. And that's when I get my best deal. The problem is, by the time they give me the best deal, I truly have decided I don't want the car. And I have to (laughs) undo that. Right? Because that's the only way you get the best deal is to convince yourself that you don't want it. That convinces them you don't want it. Then they give you the best number, and you got to tell yourself all over again, okay, maybe I do want this car. And I think that's what the Browns are trying to do here. They're they're trying to convince themselves and everyone else that they want Baker Mayfield because if they sell that legitimately and genuinely, somebody maybe calls and says, No doubt. What, what do you want for Baker Mayfield? And whoever makes the first call in those negotiations is always operating at a position of weakness to go. Yeah, Wilson, to me, the first thing that jumps out on the tape is he's a burner. The way he accelerates off the line of scrimmage puts so much pressure on defensive backs. Now, his best trait in addition to that is his body control. He reminds me a lot of C.D. Lamb when he's coming out of Oklahoma. Even if he doesn't get separation with his route, the late separation that he creates with his body control, adjusting to the ball in the air, adjusting to throws that are outside his frame, that's why he's averaging 17 yards per catch this season. He's a big time playmaker. Uh, but they lost six in a row in order to fail making it to the postseason. Now, Grant Lamar Jackson got hurt. He missed the next four of those games. But how bad was the end of the season for the Ravens? Remember, they lost J.K. Dobbins and Gus Evers before the season started, Ronnie Stanley midway through, Marlon Humphrey, Marcus Peters before the season started. I mean, this is a team that had a ton of injuries, and we're still in the mix for the playoffs. You lose six straight, it's brutal. But I, I tend to look at this, you know, two of those games were the two-point conversion attempts, right, where, where jo- John Harbaugh is getting really aggressive and, and trying to see if, you know, trying to get his team uh, some wins when he felt like he was really undermanned. Mark Andrews, incredible season, uh, usage through the roof. I gave the uh, the Ravens a B here, and uh, you know I, I think that maybe go a little bit higher. It's, it's tough to give a team a good grade when you lose six straight to close the season. This team is just devastated by injuries from Jump Street and throughout the entire year. Hmm. Devin Lloyd, love this pick. I don't think the Kobe Dean goes top ten. You say why shouldn't Devin Lloyd? I'm going to have Lloyd ahead of Dean on my rating score. So I love this pick. I know they don't go linebacker early, but this kid is so good. He's kind of got a little Devin White in him. Yeah, we're talking about intercepting passes, sacking quarterbacks, great tackler, and a great attitude about the game. Loves the game of football. In a, in a lot of ways, people are going to look at this game and say, well, yeah, the Tampa Bay Buccaneers are a really good team, so we didn't really think we were going to win this game. But what's this tell us about Jalen Hurts? And can we really invest in him as our quarterback going f- for the future? So, yeah, the fans are talking about it, and more importantly, the organization's going to debate it the whole offseason. Now, you know, Nick Sirianni kind of indicated he's prepared to go that way. Um, I don't know. It's, it's, a, it's a real... To me, it's, it's, a, it's, it's a very um, organizational, philosophical organizational decision that you're going to have to make here. You're in a position, given the draft capital that you have right now, you're in a position where you have to make a pretty big decision. Do you use those draft picks to really overhaul your defense, improve your defense, uh, and add depth and younger talent to a team that really needs it? top to bottom, which this draft you're prepared to do that. You have the picks to do that. Or do you sort of lump it all together and invest in a quarterback and decide, look, Jalen Hurts is what he is, but we need to be better than that if we're going to win big games down the road. Yeah, you mentioned the best linebacker in college football, arguably the best player on the best defense in college football. We saw them absolutely smother that Alabama offense that had very little chance, uh, Bryce Young anyway, in terms of having any opportunity to throw the football, uh, in large part because N'Kobe Dean was in, fa- was in his face for much of the evening, and that wasn't just a one-off. We saw N'Kobe Dean do that week in and week out through the season. He made huge strides from last season to this season. He was a great player last season. He has been otherworldly in 2021. And you mentioned I had him going 10th in that latest mock draft. I suspect he'll go somewhere in the 7 to 15 range, depending on team needs and how the board falls above him in terms, uh, particularly in terms of offensive players, offensive linemen and quarterbacks. And we'll see how that unfolds. But he is an absolute special talent. 
DeMarvin Leal, the defensive lineman from Texas A&M. He played a lot of end, but also played inside at tackle. He's 290 pounds, and I've never seen a guy in the trenches move on to the NFL and lose weight. So I'm assuming he's going to spend most of his time on the inside.